This is the Hour of Awesome with Robert, Chris, and Steven. This isn't the hour of neat, cool, or rad. It is all going to be awesome. All right. We are back with the Hour of Awesome, Season 2, Episode, let's call it 2. Yeah, that's where we're at. I, yeah, it's, that's it. And as professional and as always. That's us. <laughs> Crap. And we've lost our host. He apparently yes. is done for the rest of the day. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. It was the dump truck that got me. Um, it was a concrete on, mixer. On video. It's, oh, fine. Whatever. <laughs> if you're going to get into the, your uh, sci-fi here, Robert, you need to understand it. And, you know, obviously Transformer <laughs> robots are sci-fi. Is that a Transformer? It's a Transformer. Yeah, oh, it's it one of the Constructicons. It was the... So for those of you that are listening to audio, won't be able to see this. But it's the the foot of whatever the big Constructobot was from the Transformers. <laughs> Can't remember the name. Constructobot. My dad uh, drives, or used to drive a concrete mixer, hence the concrete mixer toy. Okay. And he also was a Transformer? Not that I know of, but okay. it's possible. Now, you know, actually, the more I think about it, if my dad's a Transformer, certain things make more sense in my childhood. <laughs> Fair enough, okay. fair enough. Topic of another show. <laughs> um, so tonight we decided what the hell we'd talk about science fiction. Why? Because we needed a topic and we all like sci-fi. Um, so there you go. Uh, and we have absolutely no format. Uh, we didn't decide if this was books, movies, science fiction in general, uh, or anything. So uh, since it was Chris's idea, why don't we go with Chris? Okay, yeah, sure. So... Uh, I've been a fan of sci-fi pretty much my entire life, and I was thinking about earlier today why that, why that is. Now, the type of sci-fi that I like is usually the. We were talking of uh, swords and lasers in reference to uh, Tom Merritt's um, podcast, Sword and Laser, uh, and I'm more of a laser kind of guy when it comes to the actual spacey science fiction. Pew and, pew. Yeah, right. And and I wonder. I was thinking about uh, why would that be the case. And I think for me, and I think for many science fiction writers, um, it's it's a way of saying that tomorrow can be better, right? It's an optimism for the future. Now, there's lots of dystopian sci-fi that I totally like, right? But there's always sort of like in dystopian stories, there's always like you're often this turn around, things get better. So I think I like sci-fi because I think about, you know, in the future, life can be better, better than what it is right now, you know? We can have a Starship Troopers kind of uh, military dictatorship kind of an idea. That's a good way to go. Well, you know, I'm not really focusing on Starship Troopers. I'm thinking more of the uh, the Star Trek kind of, uh, you know, way. Or, you know, but ultimately, I guess, I don't know if their life is better than ours. It's still the human condition. But I think that a lot of people look at science fiction and, and think, you know, there's promise in tomorrow, right? And this is what it could be. And, and, and you can also think of science fiction... And in that regard, too, as like an experiment, you know, as the author, if it's a movie, book, video game, it doesn't matter what it would be, and saying, you know, if this turns out to be the future, what would it be like if we pursue this, right? And you can see these different storylines, Star Trek, you know, for example, just, you know, Babylon 5, uh, whatever the case might be, as, you know, alternate futures and as experiments, you know, what could life be like? Uh, if this happened or if that were to happen. And I think that's what really draws me to science fiction in general is the sort of typically um, optimistic view that things could be better. See, it's okay. interesting. Uh, you know, I hear thing. that and I, I can buy that for one-off stories. Mm -hmm. So Gattaca, it's a great uh, investigation of the idea of what does it mean once we get into genetic testing. And we can actually do something with it because we're getting closer and closer to that point now. And so that's a great story. Star Trek, I, I don't buy that human condition future thing because I think the more and more you have to start mining this and going into, you know, movie after movie or show after show after show, um, I think you lose a lot of that and then it becomes, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel that same excitement about the future kind of an idea that, that I think that you're suggesting. Well, but Star Trek. I was thinking about utopian. what Chris said, and I, mine's broken down by genre. 
uh, or medium, I guess it would be. Uh, in my books, I hate that kind of sci-fi. I want the dystopian, nasty, Philip K. Dick, everything's going totally to crap and there's nothing we can do about it. We were screwed before we started that kind of sci-fi. But in my movies and TV, if I don't get my happy ending, I'm like really unhappy. And I'm not quite sure why that is because I don't I hate those kinds of books uh, that are all wrapped up all neatly and tightly at the end. But if it's a movie or TV and I don't get my nice Hollywood perfectly packaged, you know, Right off into the sunset, Princess Bridey kind of. So there, there's a perfect example. Princess Bride, not sci-fi. But in the book, they fall off a cliff at the end. I love that. In the movie, they ride off happily into the sunset, right? You know, and I love that. And if it was the other way around, I would have hated them both. Which, interestingly enough, the movie came before the book, too. So that was an interesting twist to go that direction. Did it? Yeah. He wrote the book as an adaptation of the screenplay that he wrote. Goldman. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I am ninety-eight percent sure he on that. Wrote it around the same time he wrote Stepford Wives. So. Yeah, I can't remember. Sorry. Right. Not, not important. <laughs> Total sidetrack. But I don't know why that is with me. You know, hearing the the both of you talk, the way you guys are explaining it, both your points of view, are way more reasonable than mine. Okay, I was wrong. You you were one hundred percent correct. The book came first. Oh well. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, I just remember seeing it significantly before the movie came out. Um, but anyway, uh, but I like, so for my movies, my movies and my TV, I prefer Chris's, uh, view of, Hey, things can be better. You know, we can be better than we are. Uh, even this stupid crap in Star Trek, like we don't have money in the future. Right. right? right. Kind of thing. Just like, Oh, what a load of crap. Nothing, <laughs> everything would fall apart. But I like that in my Star Trek. I hate that in the book. Um, so I, I, I have no idea why. So I'm kind of on both sides of your fence, but it's it's totally based on whether it's a visual medium or whether I'm creating the story in my own head. Maybe that's because I'm a more broken person, and so the stories in my own head have to fit my little more broken view. Uh, or I don't know. But the other one I see is more escapism, and I prefer happier escapism. You know, where books are like real life. So I don't know. I know that makes no sense. Didn't say it did. You should see the weird look Stephen's giving me. <laughs> You're like, I have no idea how to respond to this. He is truly a broken man. <laughs> so, and back to you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I guess I don't really have a division as to what I like to read versus what I like to um, watch. Although when it comes to reading, it's it certainly is um, the more futuristic science fiction. If I'm watching, I'm okay with fantasy. I'm okay with that kind of stuff. Uh, but when it comes to reading, uh, late a lot of the science fiction that I've been reading has been the Jack McDevitt books that are this uh, sort of alien archaeology set in the future, far future. The Alex Benedict series is set like eleven thousand years from now, right? And he does it in a way that. Is that what we're going to be like eleven thousand years from now? Yeah, probably. Because yeah, you know, we're still it kills the, everyone. We're That's going why to I don't be, like those. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be people, right? Right. We're, and, and we might have really fancy gadgets, but we're still going to just be people. We're going to be motivated by you know money or or lust or whatever the case might be. Uh, and so I kind of like that. I also like the idea of the the discovery of other civilizations that they do. And in his latest book in the Alex Benedict series, I think it's called going home. It's kind of cool because a lot of that book takes place on earth. So most of these other books don't earth is just another planet. It's the home world, whatever it's taking place on this planet called Rimway or wherever else they're, they're going. But this particular book, what he does is he almost gives you a future history of the earth uh, because the main plot device for the book is looking for uh for them ancient space program artifacts so like the apollo program and stuff like that and what happened to those artifacts during some pretty difficult times on the earth around the year 3000 give or take can't remember the dates off the top of my head they, they get lost and and so i kind of like that part of the book where you're sort of thinking ahead of what could be the future and i don't know i, I think that's what draws me to science fiction is that uh, optimism, what could be? Do you want? But do you prefer the more 
they tend to classify the more hard science fiction, or at least the science is more plausible, or are you uh, fine with the total fights of flights of fancy? I'm okay with both. I, I have read science fiction that was hard science fiction that tried to be as accurate to the science as you possibly can, especially if you start talking about things like wormholes. But, uh, you know, they try, right? That's the thing, that the whole right. point is the science is there. And then I'm, I'm also okay with books that are just blatantly wrong when it comes to the science, as long as the story is entertaining. Okay. You know, and that's the, that for me is the, is the key. I want to be entertained. And I can be entertained through hard science fiction. I know some people can't be. It gets in their way. I can be entertained with that. I can also be entertained with the, the crap science, but good science fiction. Well, can you be entertained if it's trying to be hard science fiction, but they screw something up horribly on the science? Uh, as, a, as a physicist, I should say no. <laughs> but as a person, I, I say yes, as long as the story's good. Okay. Because this is not a textbook, right? I'm not trying to learn anything about science here. I think that's pretty cool because the you know the physicist isn't as irritated I think as the social scientists here are. Um, <laughs> I want it to either be as hardcore as it can be or just totally say f it, mm -hmm. you know, and just say screw it, we don't care, we're gonna just write a story and just go for it, and you know, I'm gonna push a button on his nose and he will mutate, you know, kind of a thing. And why? Because the science says noses do this. <laughs> I mean, just totally just. Asinine but see, that, that's okay if you're consistent within the story. And that's actually where the problem is. And that's where actually I, I think you run into a lot of problems with, with um, TV shows and so forth or, or, you know, movie series. Is that if they create a plot control. device, right, and then, you know, what do you do with it? Like, you know, Superman can fly can backwards around the earth and <laughs> go back in time. Like, why does that happen every time? Every, every time something happens, I just go back around the earth, problem solved. <laughs> Um, oh, see, that doesn't bug, bug me as much as like when he moved the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. What's wrong with that? To create an eclipse. <laughs> yeah. it doesn't, and you've destroyed the Earth. Thank you, Superman. Just life on Earth, not the Earth. Which yeah. I guess just makes it the latest Superman movie. God, what an ass hat he was. Yeah. What one? Which one? Man of Steel. Oh, right. whatever. Superman became Batman. He liked no. to break things. Batman never killed anybody. Mm. Superman killed a well, couple hundred thousand people in that film. That's what he does. So, yeah. Well, there's Batman versus Superman, or Superman versus Batman. I can't remember the order coming up. It's yeah. Superman versus Affleck. They're not going to get it right. So, I mean, they're trying to go off the. Um, oh crap! Help me here, Stephen. The Dark Knight guy. Uh yeah. Nolan. No. Miller. Miller. Frank Miller. Oh. Uh, oh. You know the. Uh, his his graphic novel series. Mm. Uh, well, the best part about that, quite frankly, I thought was the one armed Green Arrow shooting a Kryptonite arrow into Superman. You know, it was like, whoa! And Superman tore his arm off. Yeah, well, that didn't work. He's got teeth. <laughs> Back arrow with his teeth. Uh, so it's like Superman's brutal and kind of a tool. <laughs> Which is why the uh, Suicide Squad movie actually might not be awful if they do it right though i have no faith that they'll do it right but oh dude you just want your deadpool so, did you see the mother's day thing yep. deadpool yes <laughs> that couldn't have been well more offensive <laughs> that was kind of the point <laughs> yeah so uh listeners if you haven't just do a quick google image search deadpool mother's day it should be the first thing that pops yes. up i can't believe there'd be too many other images that would pop up with a joint search of deadpool plus mother plus day i yeah. So where do you guys put superhero genre stuff? Completely it's separate. Not, it's not really sci-fi. It's not really fantasy. I mean, it's, well, if you had to pick one, it's way more fantasy than it is sci-fi. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't classify that as fantasy either, though. Well. I mean, it's, not, it's not Tolkien. All right. It's so. Thing. But let, let's be clear about something here. Um, because of the. Uh, rights issues that Marvel got into, you know, is when they were selling off all their rights to all their stuff. Yeah. All of the movie series that they currently have now is actually attempting to be sci-fi. They're trying to explain away everything within their universe with science. Maybe right. hokey science, but science nonetheless. Well, uh, how do you explain Doctor Strange? Well, that's the one they haven't dealt with yet, though. Yeah, or, well, how did they deal with Scarlet Witch? Uh, that was science. 
Was that was they had the they ultimate power. Was, yeah, it was it was a uh, uh, from the the see, Infinity see. Stone. Oh, okay. Which I guess we're trying to claim is science. <laughs> well, the way that they do it, they say it's a supercomputer. Yeah, it's high technology. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what? A, okay. Well, you know, you get to that part where you know technology that gets to a certain level of advancement beyond wherever we are is indistinguishable from magic, right? Oh, yeah. Techno mages. Yeah yeah. 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 I actually uh, really like those. If you don't remember. Uh, those were from Babylon 5? Babylon yeah, 5. I wish they would have done more with those. The Techno Mages were awesome. Yeah, because yeah. that was supposed to be pure science masquerading as magic. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I love that. They had they some pretty good books. Oh, really? Yeah. I never read any of the books. Uh, I think it was three, maybe four books just on the Techno Mages. Huh. Yeah. No, I mean, they're crappy TV tie-in books, so <laughs> not right. super high quality. Right. Uh, but at least you got a little more because um, Crusader, the spinoff, you know, had a techno mage as part of the crew, but they never did. They were just crap. That whole yeah. series was crap. Yeah, that didn't get very, get very far. So, so uh, the question becomes, I guess, in, in, following this logic, is the, the boundary between sci-fi and fantasy whether or not there's magic? Uh, no, not for me. No, yeah. An, an attempted grounding in reality. All right, uh, so what is Dresden Files? Well, see, that, that doesn't even attempt to ground itself in any kind of science. I think where you get a little more bent is, do you remember what is it, the Sword of Shannara? Mm -hmm. And that is supposed to be the future, and the magic is sort of explained away as mutation, uh, and other stuff that was around. Metachlorians. Yeah, not that bad. <laughs> but... Uh, I remember that being more one of those magic is a form of a post-apocalyptic thing, but not in the way that. What was the the D and D spinoff that had that Shadowrun? Yeah, not in a Shadowrun sort of way. Or like yeah, Shadowrun, it was actual magic. I mean, MIT yeah. became like the Massachusetts Institute of Institute of Technology and Magic. Yeah. Right, <laughs> they had changed all of this, and I played Shadowrun for a while in my younger days. There were some fairly good books for that one, too. There, there were, and it was more of a, ma a mishmash of science fiction and fantasy. I know, I, it, it's hard for me to say Shadowrun was this and not that. Uh, I think where, in some people's minds, the line blurs is uh, Star Wars. And I don't yeah. see Star Wars as science fiction. I see it as fantasy. Yeah, yeah well, it's the hero's journey, so which is right. typically more fantasy. Yeah. Right. Because science has really very little to no place in the movie, in any of the movies. Well, he made the Kessel run in less than, space than 12 parsecs. As sci fi, then? I'm sorry? Because that's, I think you could, I, I see Star Wars as a space opera. Sure. And uh, I can't think of any sci fi, any space operas that I really think of as sci fi. I think of them almost in their own category. It's I have like a, um, uh, high I, fantasy when you do like Tolkien level stuff. Mm -hmm. seems to be almost its own category mm -hmm. you know comparing that to like the dresden files which is i, I love that stuff um uh it's a one he's a great writer he just writes in a very engaging way butcher Jim yeah. butcher is it yeah, yeah. um and I, I like fantasy crap <laughs> um but those the i don't know maybe it could be a little bit more nuanced because what happens when you add um like sigh into stuff because frequently those tend to be more sci-fi-ish uh, than fantasy-ish kind of books. but And there's a tenuous atten attention to science sometimes. Um, but those, again, do you really think of those as sci-fi? Because I really don't. They just seem to be mental magic books. Right. <laughs> that now, just more contemporary than fantasy setting. There was a heated conversation I was a part of that at a, on a cruise ship. Uh, well, there's a good place to get an argument. Yeah, yeah. So there was a <laughs> science fiction quiz, like that was like one of the the activities for the people who didn't want to go out and be in the sun. <laughs> and so it was a uh, sci-fi uh, so quiz, and I had made the comment because I had somebody brought it up. I had made the comment that uh, you know Star Wars wasn't really science fiction, and you would have thought that I had done some kind of blasphemous act you know you had. right you there crap on star wars man. <laughs> i was not crapping on star wars i like star wars quite a bit 
But in Star Wars, science doesn't take the role of solving problems. It doesn't take any role at all. No, right? we're talking, it's all about faith. You, right. you linked a, a what could be taken as a negative comment with Star Wars. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Sorry raped their childhood, essentially, would be the way they'd put it in that horribly overblown way. I hate that term, but they say crap like that. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mean, it's just, I do not see it as science fiction. Um, as much as I, I like the, the movie, I like the franchise, uh, just, it's, it's just not science fiction. Yeah, well, clearly, because they ripped off the Bible. <laughs> okay. So what's Firefly? Uh, cowboys in space? Yes. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. So again, does it fit into science, sci-fi, or fantasy? I don't think it's either. It's a Western that just happens to have starships. Yeah. Spaceships. Yeah, yeah it's a Western. It's a modern it's, Western. Right. Yeah. Or a postmodern Western. With, well, yeah, with swearing in Chinese, see if we get it past the TV sensors. Right. <laughs> well, you know, and I think what a lot of people do is they say spaceship must be sci-fi. Yeah. We can't hear you anymore. Oh, sorry. You went so far away. They say, oh, sorry about that. They say, uh, they see a spaceship and they say, oh, this must be sci fi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. They just link that together. Um, Although there's about? a great fantasy series where the guy lands on a planet in a spaceship and then you never see spaceships or any kind of modern technology, the rest of the thing, and it's all magic. Yeah. <laughs> and I really love that because I think that was a total F you to that idea that. Well, there was a spaceship and it must be sci-fi now i will have a 10 book fantasy series but i'm going to say it's sci-fi because i started with a spaceship i can't even remember what it was but I, I like it when you know the uh authors will mess with people that way okay. you know, so they can classify things differently for like catalogs <laughs> so steven what about you i don't think we've quite gotten around to you yet directly as to mm. yeah. what it is that you like what do i like um I would say I would have read probably more fantasy than sci-fi. I liked sort of the magic piece because it's not real. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess I guess sci-fi could be real, and I don't like reading real per se. Um, well, let's back up a little. Chris said he's been in sci-fi all his life. When did, was it the same for you? Because it was not for me. Oh, I mean, I read that stuff from, yeah. That was what my dad read. My dad was a hard was actually a a more sort of a hard sci-fi sci-fi guy, um, and so I read it read that stuff. But I branched in and read all this this fantasy stuff, which he never picked up much of, uh, though he would read like sort of Shannara or something like that. So he would get a piece of these things. But I read much more into the fantasy side, and he would read this the sci-fi side, and I'd read the sci-fi stuff too. Uh, though I have fortunately didn't read that ten book series by uh, L. Ron Hubbard. Um, <laughs> He, I, I remember it sitting on the shelf for the longest time. I'm not sure if he ever read it, but he bought the whole series. And I can remember seeing it on the shelf for like a decade. <laughs> so, I had the whole series. Space. For free. Yeah. <laughs> he had a shelf to fill. Yeah. And he wanted a common color scheme. <laughs> <laughs> See, my first exposure to sci-fi was uh, Star Wars. And then Alien. Um Mine was movies. Uh, but but you just said that Star Wars wasn't sci-fi. you you got to be consistent, man. Well, no, no. I'm saying my first exposure to any of this crap. Oh, okay. Uh, then Battlestar Galactica on TV. So all around that late, mm, what is it, late 70s yes. uh, kind of stuff. My first foray in, like, books uh, was Lord Foulsbane by Stephen R. Donaldson you know, at, like, 11 I think I was. Um, so it was uh, these kind of semi-twisted fantasy books, uh, okay. with a from with a very dystopian view of of. I mean, for fantasy, that is not uplifting fantasy. That is everything's going to shit in my personal life, and everything's mm -hmm. going that way in the fantasy world too. Yes. And I got leprosy, and wow, it sucks. And, but white gold. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it just all very bizarre. Yep. Um, so, and then I guess after that would have been William Gibson and Philip mm -hmm. K. Dick novels. Yep. Uh, so this kind of really downward spirally stuff. Um, but it, for me, it, was, it wasn't it was a written form until um, I got to junior high school. And then, because I, I could barely read, uh, could barely spell, and then had an English class where your grade was based on how many, how many pages you read. 
<laughs> in books. And they were like, I finally have control of my grade and get an A in English. <laughs> just started reading everything I give my hands on. And you just had to get book reports. And it was like, awesome. So I read all the time then. Um, and then got addicted because, well, that's the way my personality goes. Um, so you decided to read all the books ever published. I've read a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> he has. Yeah. I can vouch for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the time I got out of high school, I probably had 40,000 books. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of books. I've seen the rate that you've bought books on Kindle, so I can I can believe that. <laughs> yeah, I was reading two or three novels a night uh, for a while there. I read very quickly. Um, <laughs> mainly it's because I had to feed the beast uh, and get this crap crammed in my head. I also read things multiple times. Like the Amber series by Zelazny, um, really small books. You know, it wouldn't even be considered novels now. Be novellas at best. But I've read those probably a dozen times, the whole series. Um, found those when I first went off to college and discovered the glory of the used bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, oh, much better now that I have to actually pay for my own crap. I can't mooch off mom and dad to get my stuff. Those uh, are dangerous, those used yeah. bookstores. Yeah. So, yeah, they loved me. Sell to them at quarter price, buy it at half price. Sell? No, you don't sell. Oh, okay. That's the way we went through. I never kept a single book. Oh, yeah. It's been very hard for me to give up my books. So I'm now down to, I've really pared down my collection. I still have every Doctor Who book ever made. Uh, why? Because I just can't give them up. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, so what, you know, Doctor Who, I'd call that fantasy. So, to me. And there's definitely spaceships and aliens and crap involved in that. But I don't know. I think my, my lines blur based on more my feel of the material than what actually goes on in the material. Okay. Yeah. I, I You know, and I think that a lot of this is true for most people. Maybe they realize it or maybe they don't realize it, that what how you separate science fiction from fantasy is, is very much um, an individual. And usually interest in one i shouldn't say usually but often interest in one leads to interest in the other uh one of my earliest memories of the genre was actually fantasy because my mom when i was a kid my mom would read to my brother and i at night and one of the earliest books i remember her reading to me was um the hobbit and then we got into the lord of the rings trilogy and all of that and that really helped to sort of get me interested Books that I was reading on my own, though, tend to be more or less science fiction. I remember in uh, high school giving a stab at the uh, the Stars Like Dust by Asimov. He's one of my favorite, maybe my favorite science fiction writer. Um, and not really quite appreciating that book until I reread it many years later after reading all of his other fiction books from the <laughs> Foundation, Robot, and Empire, and how they sort of just said, let's just tie them all together, plop, <laughs> you know, and uh, related all those books together. Um, but I, I would say if, if I had a favorite science fiction series in book form, it would be the Foundation uh, books. Really? By Asimov. Yeah, I yeah. like them a lot. I appreciate Asimov, but his books make me sleepy. <laughs> really? I find them utterly fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I guess my favorite science fiction author would be Greg Bear. Okay. Um, so also a relatively hard science fiction Right, relatively, um, but I don't know, something about his style kind of grabs me. I had problems getting into his books. I tried. I think it was the Oceans of Night. Yeah, yeah, and I believe I finished that book, but I don't remember. Mm. Uh, it was just a book that really didn't stand out to me. Uh, had a problem getting. Into it. He he wrote after Asimov died. He wrote some of the um, Foundation books. Yeah, Foundation yeah. books, and I think my biggest sort of um, thing about the foundation books is I really wish that um, he would have written after foundation and earth which chronologically in the in the time frame of the foundation series is the last book which only it takes place like 700 and some years after the foundation was formed but the idea of the foundation was that it would last a thousand years and give birth to a new galactic sort of empire and we never got to see that happen yeah, when he not, wrote, never all tied up right because right. when he got done with foundation and earth he wrote prequels he wrote forward the foundation and prelude to foundation which were a great way to connect a lot of the different novels together 
but it would have been nice to see sort of the back end of that story. It could. You kind of wonder a little bit if it was a little bit like Python, where they see the setup and the the story is the good part, and that figured if they actually gave the punchline, it would ruin everything. Well, maybe. He may have been worried that what he saw as his finish mm -hmm. uh, would have maybe wrecked it for people. Because think of how many books or movies we see, and it's great right till the end. And then you go, ah, oh, they just blew it. Now, and maybe you figure, well, I'll just stop. You know, not for well, something completely different. Yeah, and the way that book ends, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, right, a lot of uncertainty, and so you can kind of write the ending in your own, your own. Yes, yeah. but I still would like to have seen what he would have done. Do you know if anybody's dragged up notes or anything? You know, like I don't. With Tolkien, yeah, I don't know. He wrote Asimov wrote a lot of books, not just science fiction, but uh, science books as well. A very prolific art. I think he wrote over 400 books. Yeah, he wrote a bunch of fantasy books too. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not as familiar with those. Oh, the dude could write. Yeah, <laughs> man's a machine. Yeah, you almost start to wonder if he's like the guy who did uh, the Three Musketeers. I can't remember. Dumas. Yes, who didn't actually write any of his own stuff. He had a team of writers that wrote it, and he took all the credit. So <laughs> he's got like a thousand books he's written. Well, you have to, again, keep in mind that if you're coming through like the 50s and 60s, you were paid for by the word and you're doing all this stuff in the pulp and right. you just, these people were just writing unbelievable amounts. I mean, so many of those writers at that time popped out a ton of stuff. Yeah. So, and particularly how popular sort of pulp sci-fi was, you know, you have a Heinlein or you have a whatever. I mean, there's just doing tons of these things. I was still getting a lot of those, um. God, I can't even remember. Amazing Stories was one. Um, but wh whatever the big science fiction ones that Asimov and stuff were writing for, I was still getting those in the 80s. You know, getting things that were serialized and consuming that way. Mm -hmm. Although I don't like short stories, but I do like serialized novels. So. Okay. You getting feedback? No. Okay. You're losing your mind. Don't worry, though. No, it's long since been lost, man. That's Fair what I was. It didn't come <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. I've been looking. I had a flashlight. And I didn't lose it near the street lamp, but that's where I look anyway. So let me let me put this as a slightly different transition. Um, the way most people consume, I mean, obviously, there's a ton of people still consuming books, and they're fantastic. But a lot of people in society are consuming via other forms of media, basically TV and movies, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, my initial reaction was when we were having this conversation was that, you know, all of the movies that have done anything good or all the TV shows that anything good are, are sci-fi. And then I said, well, oh, well, of course, there, there was, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings. Okay, that was okay. But the, everything else, anything that was ever popular, oh, oh, there was the Harry Potter. And then I start going through, I'm saying, okay, well, there's a couple of big series that have worked. But we're still mostly have have stayed away from doing fantasy in terms of movies or TV. Is, is that an accurate statement? Well, I think for a long time they had to keep away from it because the special effects weren't up to it. And so you ended up with crap like Willow. Uh, Willow! Especially for television because the budget's oh, yeah, totally. smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everything had to be cloudy and dark or else you might actually see something and wreck it. Or sci-fi like was easier to fake up. What's wrong with Willow? Val Kilmer? No, I love Willow, actually. Okay, good. Right. Um, they have Billy Barty in it. Um, <laughs> what controls the future? Um, nobody. You're supposed to point to his thumb. That's how you pass the apprentice test. And it's see, been a long you time since Willow, that's... And I'm the one who actually knows about it. It's been a long um, time. Yeah, that time bandits... Books with any, anything that I like that stuff. Uh, <laughs> crazy weird things with the little. Pictures. All right, so you're saying that the graphics we can fake because you know you said Battle Battlestar Galactica earlier. The '70s version of that thing was leftover props from Star Wars. I mean, they didn't do anything. No well, special like, effects of any kind. Well, no, they did, and Niall M was involved in a lot of it. Uh, but you were able to fake that up way more than you can. A dragon you know um so i think 
and you can only do practical modeling for so much and kind of get away with it. You end up with you know, like the the old bad Sinbad movies, one of the funny walking claymation. Yeah, yeah, it was clearly claymation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crap. Yeah. Um, or Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. So some of that stuff is just bad. I mean, a, a man in a suit in a gorilla suit is a man in a gorilla suit. It's only so much you can do with that. Um, so I think some of it was the nature of the medium. I think some of it was the accessibility for a non-fan audience. It's easier for, for example, my wife is not into sci-fi or fantasy. I can drag her to a sci-fi movie and she'll get it way quicker than she ever would a fantasy movie. Because at least it's still people doing people things. <laughs> as opposed to weird magical systems or weird fantastical creatures or requiring having to understand some lore out of an alternate world I, sci-fi I, kind of builds upon our world yeah. generally I, my wife is the same way mm-hmm. much harder sell for the fantasy yeah now we'll see when the warcraft movie comes out i think that's going to be the first real test of can fantasy work now is it still duncan jones doing it yeah okay uh it keeps getting bumped because they keep moving around star wars and no one's stupid enough to go up against star wars uh, but he's already done a sci-fi like a hardcore sci-fi piece so well and he's a hardcore world of warcraft fan right 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 so uh he they picked the right guy mm-hmm. but i don't think i think it will either succeed or fail on whether people will watch fantasy movies because lord of the rings had an audience kind of built in uh it was epic in the way it looked you could still kind of relate to it on a human level um, but if they get their 10 million pretty, subscribers they get their 10 million subscribers to pay $10 for the movie ticket. You've already made a ton of money. Well, it'll open well. Yeah. But will it go to a general public? I mean, it's not going to do Star Wars money. Well, it's not going to do Avengers money either. No. No. Um, no fantasy. Because Harry Potter... It's, it's a boarding a school movie. movie. Yeah. It's, or it's a book about boarding it's school. It's a coming of age. It is. Thing it about is. Kids. Yeah. And uh, so now... If we wanted to call the the god awful sparkly vampire crap <laughs> fantasy, then I guess you say, yeah, there's a super massive audience and uh, people <laughs> that will go to watch this stuff because Twilight went huge. Yeah, but Twilight, the fans of Twilight are the same fans of Fifty Shades of Grey since they it is a fan fiction anyway. I don't. I wouldn't know. It is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's, absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, and vampire porn tends to do well. And rice, uh, but so I don't know if you can really count that as fantasy, though. So I don't know if it's ever really been tested because I don't consider the Lord of the Rings a test. I think you have to take something that doesn't come from an established book series with a built-in literary base. You know, well, because Harry Potter, people were into that damn book, and it's a it's a, an incredibly engaging book, right? So. Yeah, I think this will be the first test because there are Warcraft books, but people don't go into Warcraft because of books. They, you got a bunch of Warcraft, you know, video game fans who then want more lore, who then read the books. I don't think those books are a gateway drug to <laughs> the online game. Well, and a lot of these things evolve too. So let's go back to the sparkly vampires, right? <laughs> so with Dracula, when Bram Stoker wrote that, that was horror, right? And right. the first vampire movies or horror so it wasn't science fiction versus fantasy this was a horror genre right that's what this was and so but over time the vampire sort of got neutered and what happened with the vampire was things like buffy the vampire slayer which i love that show Mm -hmm. yeah okay but this is no longer the vampire it's still a a a bad guy yeah but but it's not horror but it's not horror right and, and yeah, and and that sort of is the bridge of the vampire becoming less horror, and like going to Twilight. Yeah, right. I mean, but you see TV shows too, like you know Forever Night. That's where the vampires were, both horror and human. Okay. Yeah. Another bridge. Yeah, that was a good series. Because you know Lacroix was TV. awful, right? Oh, he was an awful was. being. Yeah, yeah I was a horrible being, right? And and that, but um, Nick Knight was a vampire, 
but very human. And and so again, it's one of those. I think it's one of those bridge shows where the where the vampire has changed genres. And I think we see some of that with science fiction as well, where um, it, where I think we talk about some of these shows as being space operas, where if they had been put out a few decades before, maybe it would have been considered straight up science fiction. No, because you still had freaking John Boy in space. Remember that one? Oh god, what was that? Okay, it had John Boy. The actor played space? John Boy. What? Was it Lost in Space? No, 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 no. Not Lost happened. in Space. That okay. was Total Camp. <laughs> yeah. No, they did a. They had a bunch of. It's like maybe Roger Corman. But it had the guy from The Man from Uncle. He was in it, and it's like one of the worst sci-fi movies ever. It completely takes itself serious, and it is such a. I will use this mystical thing we have called the internet to find it. Yeah, because I don't know what you're talking about. Space yeah. was. We just ignore them and move on. It's for yeah. The best. yeah, yeah, it's probably for the best. But do you see? What, I guess what I'm trying to say is that these things evolve, and how we classify these things change. Battle Beyond the Stars. No idea. No idea. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's go a different direction. What was Wizard of Oz? Wasn't that like about politics? Well, okay, if everything is about something else, I mean, that's it, it is that way, right? <laughs> Isn't sci-fi supposed to be that yes. way? Good sci-fi is telling you a different story, you know, or it's telling a modern-day story but set in the future in order to give you parables. I'll give I mean, you... I'll, I'll give... I don't think what's your thoughts? Fantasy. You don't say what now? I say it's I don't fantasy. think there's a complicated subtext to a Philip K. Dick story. Fine. High fantasy. High sci-fi. Well, I know that was the whole point behind a lot of Star Trek. Make these things palatable. Uh, dealing with potentially hot button social issues, but you dress it in sci fi and then everybody can like go, oh, yeah, but it's sci fi. You know, the whole uh, interracial kiss thing mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff that they do in um, Star Trek is kind of famous for. Yeah, well, and science fiction is, is a good medium for that. Yeah. Yeah, you can to explore anything you want. Well, ex yeah. as you said at the beginning well, of this. For example, you started with Starship Troopers. Uh, you started which I don't believe was about a military dictatorship. <laughs> it's a totally different issue. It was um, Rome. No, it wasn't. Yes. No, you had to have military service in order to have the right to vote. Yes, that's Rome. No, no Citizens. Rome. It's not the way Rome worked. I was there. Anyway, <laughs> you were there. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, you short little man who had lead poisoning. <laughs> Uh, Fall of the Roman Empire, aqueducts. Um, yeah, the, I, I think a lot of people for a long time have used these as alternative ways of exploring things. Uh, what is it? The Left Hand of Darkness, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. Is that how you say her name? Um, that was the one with uh, with three genders. Uh, but it was uh, a sci-fi yeah. story. It was a way to explore those kinds of issues during an era where you talked about any kind of, um, you know, other sexual preferences or uh, sexual identity issues, and so oh, you'd be roasted. Mm. You know, she was able to put it in a way that you could start to explore some of this stuff without people immediately going, you know, burner witch kind of a thing. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's true. I don't think fantasy really does that. You don't really see them exploring contentious contemporary issues through other forms as much. I mean, even if you're, because, come on, Game of Thrones? <laughs> None of that is a proxy of anything. I don't I don't get HBO, so I've seen zero Game of Thrones. Most um, people watch Game of Thrones and still get HBO. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, that's most, true. Most pirated show on television, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, trying to be only up and up and all. Good citizen. <laughs> but, yeah, but you're right. I, science fiction has multiple times explored... Um, what are very controversial topics. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind in an additional example, uh, Battlestar Galactica, the newer one, right. uh, there was an episode where they looked at suicide bombing. And this happened to be at a time where this was big in the news because of what was going on uh, in the Middle East. And so um, it still is going on in the Middle East. But uh, they basically were trapped on this planet they thought they were going to settle there they thought they escaped through the cylons everything seemed to be good and then lo and behold of course the cylons come back and they're taken over they take over the government so on
for the people who were part of the Battlestar uh, want to fight back. They're in no position to, because they're overwhelmed by military force. Right? There's no way they don't have the manpower, they don't have the weapons, they just don't, they cannot do this. So they resort to suicide bombing tactics. And it was an interesting thing. It really resonated with me because, you know, at the time you're looking at the news, uh, at least, you know, as, as an American, you're like, oh, I can't believe, you know, people would, would go do this. And then all of a sudden, and, 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 and we certainly, you know, weren't, the media was not something we were rooting for these people, right? I mean, these were doing awful things, right? But then you're watching the show and you've been rooting for the Battlestar, right? You've been rooting for this crew, fighting against these odds. And all of a sudden, they start doing the suicide bombing. And as a viewer, I have to say, as a viewer, consumer of media, it put me in probably the most uncomfortable position that media has ever put me in. And I didn't know what to do. I was watching the show. I'm thinking, first, it's great television. All right. It's great storytelling. And second, I was uncomfortable as hell. Because <laughs> I don't know what I should be doing. Uh, also, uh, in that vein, too, is the show Continuum. When that first came out, yeah. um, that was a show where, you know, uh, the female lead character was a police officer in a not so good regime in the future, which was the acceptable sort of corporate driven, corporate ruled kind of thing. Right. And um, she comes back and she's supposed to be the good guy. And the terrorists are actually fighting for enhanced freedom, breaking from this corporate structure, right? What we would label to be good things in our society, right? In our culture right now. And no, I want corporate controlled future. Yeah, you want corporate controlled right? <laughs> And so that's a show that, especially the first couple of seasons, sorry about that, the first couple of seasons, um, I, I felt just very odd while watching it. Maybe I thought about it too, too much. But it was like, who should I be rooting for here? You got to get what you want to get out of your own media, man. If you yeah. get, if you enjoy it in a certain way, it's right. Yeah. yeah. So I like that show, and unfortunately, that show is 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 on the outs. Uh, I think it's been renewed for six more episodes starting in July. So at least just it wasn't to just finish it up. Yeah, they, it's like alphas where it's just like done. <laughs> yeah, we'll end it here or a revolution. That was uh, just, you know. Alphas was finally getting good. Yeah. <laughs> I well, they just, cancel these things just about the time I start to enjoy them. They they just announced that they're only doing 13 more episodes of Person of Interest. Similar idea. Which that was a That's show that it. went from being watchable to not at all. But Yeah. yeah continue the Daredevil Scott, awesome. If you guys have not seen the new Daredevil, that is oh. truly cool television. Yeah. So we're kind of stepping away from sci-fi here. But yeah, I've seen the first three episodes. Uh, outstanding. I have yeah, to get I've Netflix a, some month or year. I saw the whole thing now, and I sort of binged, like, the last five. There's, I think there's only 12, 13. Yeah, there's like, I think there's 13 episodes, yeah. And some of the best TV I've seen. So I like this now that TV is now what movies used to be. Some of the best stuff's on TV and mm -hmm. movies now, mm -hmm. a lot of times, are just, like, fluffy, overpriced crap. I and, can't believe that Furious 7 would be fluffy, overpriced crap. Well, no, of course not. <laughs> it's not fluffy. <laughs> there was things dri people driving fast and things blowing up. What more do you need in a movie? That's how you defined what you thought was a good movie. Uh, that's true. <laughs> well, I did. I've grown uh, since then, Stephen. I dragged my wife to go see the first G.I. Joe movie. And, and you're still said, married. What's it about? And I said, shit blows up. She said, no, what's the plot? I said, that's the plot. <laughs> I said, what else do you need? <laughs> and, and, and I was there was truth in advertising yeah. <laughs> and I loved every moment of it so his brain turned off crap blew up it was just one big spectacular set piece um, but so you should enjoy John Wick if you haven't seen that I, I really did enjoy that film yeah I haven't seen it that was a spectacular was there, he had three good. lines of dialogue in that whole film how can you go wrong with a Keanu film with three lines of dialogue yeah but it was it was much better than that film had any right to be. I mean, it's beautifully shot. Mm -hmm. So it's a spectacular. Well, action. considering that it's directed by the stunt coordinators from the Matrix. Like, I mean, it doesn't, there's no reason why it should have been put together the way it was, but it was. So it reminded me, as far as visual 
something visually that I just really enjoyed, uh, like the the first Raid movie. Mm-hmm. It had that same constant, you know, adrenaline rush, just looked spectacular, kind of thing. Uh, even though it had more downtime, mm-hmm. I, I would I would say it had more downtime, but it still worked. The emotional overtones of this whole all this crap with his wife it was just like, yeah, well, come on, <laughs> go kick someone's ass. That's what I'm here for. Get away with that. You know, I was actually motive. following an interesting. Uh, I killed your dog. That's enough motivation. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> following an interesting di- uh, a discussion about um, how you know certain films being made outside the U.S. system makes them interesting at the same time you can't reproduce them. So, you know, all of the Mad Max films really were made in Australia by Australian people. Like the first, you know, film was made for like $40,000 kind of a deal. And people were just, you know, throwing themselves in front of speeding cars, you know, and, and it made it really, you know, that, that high paced frenetic action thing because people were really risking their lives. Same thing with the raid is, you know, Gareth Evans in, in, uh, Indonesia, you know, making this film with locals doing this stuff. I mean, it was just dirty in that space. You know, you try to drop that thing into the U.S. in the U.S. system or Vancouver, whatever. You you just can't film it that way. You can't get the people who are as the same anything. So it just doesn't have the right. Yeah. You know, both of that. It's a little bit of lightning in a bottle, maybe. You know. Well, I mean, shit. Now, now that we have. all of these Mad Max films made across f- four decades, basically, all with the same director and all actually quite Is interesting. One out? Yeah, this oh, weekend. This weekend. This weekend. Oh. No, I haven't seen. It. It's coming out this weekend. So I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. As long as it isn't, you know, who owns by the town. No, no. They actually said it's it's. <laughs> there's a big argument that it may be the best one they've done. So more like, oh, I heard this discussion, which I think would be worth going on it's a total side thing on whether the second film in a trilogy is ever the good one and the you know, the context where it came up with where the second film was the good one was mad max where road warrior was the better of the three films i thought that was like the the definition i thought you'd have uh godfather part two you had empire strikes back yeah that's what i was thinking too especially empire yeah but in uh you, you, you find that most of the time, that's just not the case. Well, yeah, because it's hard to reproduce and jump. I mean, you have to build off yeah, of it and make like it better. It's always like first and third. Because it was in a discussion of uh, Age of Ultron that it's the linking film. But the second one frequently is relegated to this linking uh, phase where it's the setup for the third film. When is the third film good? Uh, I like the third Indiana Jones film. Fine. Uh, so. The second one was a horror film. Well, it's a different genre. That was the yeah. problem. Yeah, but I, I mean, there the the third one was the good one. Um, I like the third Harry Potter. It's because they changed directors. Yeah, that could be. That was the huge part. You went from to an actual well, like I did fantastic like the director. First one though with Chris Columbus. The first two were both Chris Columbus. Yeah, but I don't like the second one. Yeah, the that was the stupid spider one, right? I don't know. I can't I keep tell you they all blur together. Yeah, yeah, but um, that a lot of times it's 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 first and third. Uh oh, uh, Iron Man. First and third are the better ones. The middle one's crap. I'd even debate in some respects how good the third one was. Yeah, yeah the second third one. Yeah. And actually, the the first one after the you know the the climax was was awful. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought of a contradiction. Winter Soldier, that. That was much better than Captain America. And I like Captain America. Yeah. But again, it switched yeah, genres. much better Superman than Superman. I, I think he switched genres, and that's why. And it became a spy film. Right. Yeah. So if you can do that, that has a different conversation. I mean, it could go terribly, or it could be good, but... Yeah. Well, I think... Anyway, I hope the new Mad Max is good, because... <laughs> It's the fourth I wanted, one. Up. I wanted that interceptor for so long, <laughs> and by the time I finally had enough money to actually get it, I kind of grew out of it, and was just like, "Damn it!" <laughs> Run out of the phase where I could actually buy one of these, get one put together, and get the modifications to, to have that car. And I was like, uh, "Damn age, <laughs> maturity that'll teach me." Well, so. I think there's one medium that we should cover before we wrap things up in our hour of awesomeness. Oh, uh, we miss. Yeah, we got it. We got some time. Video games. 
Oh. And we've talked about how sort of books do both well, right? Sci-fi and, 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 and fantasy can do both well. Movies, you know, we talked about science fiction as sort of being the possibly the better of the two. Video games, I think, fan is, um, does fantasy better. I think it depends on style. Uh, I prefer my science fiction shooters mm -hmm. and my fantasy RPGs. Yes. Yeah, I, that's fair. That's fair. Because um, I haven't enjoyed, I think, any of the fantasy shooters. Uh, let's see. There's one called, I think it's called Dark Watch, which was on the Xbox, the first Xbox system, which I would consider fantasy. Well, fantasy slash horror. That was a shooter. That was an enjoyable game. But I'm trying to think of fantasy shooters. It's Dark not. Games. I'm sorry. Dark Souls. Didn't Maybe play Dark it. Dark Souls or Demon yeah. Souls. Yeah. Fantasy. Because when I'm thinking itself. shooter, I mean not necessarily shooting, but a first-person fighting game, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah, where I think I prefer. Because it's not third person, because I prefer, um, in my RTSs, I prefer s science fiction also. And I've played a lot of fantasy RTS games. Mm -hmm. um, but I much prefer, say, StarCraft to WarCraft 3. Um, same company, you know, making both. But I think I prefer sci-fi in my real-time strategy games. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. They all yeah. do them all well. Horror can be done very well by the right people. I mean, Silent Hill is a brilliant ah, horror game. Brilliant game. Uh, I don't like the horse shooters. I think you did, though. Uh, I didn't like Fear. Uh, I thought it was fine. It's not like a standout game. In fact, I'd forgotten about it until you just said the title. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think I enjoyed playing it while I played it. Or like the Resident Evil games. Uh I liked, uh, I liked what Resident did we play? Evil. Dead Island. I enjoyed that, but I think more because we were playing as a group. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That, I think that game would have been painful solo. Yeah. Uh, oh, let's flip this another another way. How much of that is the story and how much of it is just the you know multiplayer aspect of something? I mean, if you go historically, it was multiplayer. Or excuse me, it was, it was a single player campaign run through from beginning to end. You get 10 hours, 20 hours, 40 hours of, of gameplay, right? Um, once you flip the switch onto multiplayer, you can do RPG or you can do, you know, um, uh, an FPS or something like that, or a, a MOBA. Um, but do the story still there at all? Yes, I, mean, I think still in, in pretty much anything Bioware touches, you know, um, the Mass Effect games, everybody talks about story, um, story and destiny. Oh, Okay, the lack of story in Destiny. about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, people talk about it. But... <laughs> yeah, Bioshock. It's an interesting yes. visual world, but the story was also very cool. Uh, I enjoyed that story a lot. Fallout. And that's an open world kind of shooter, but I enjoyed the, that post-apocalyptic story. And there's the story's pretty thin. It is. Um, and I would still but I did enjoy it. Yeah. I think it tied the world together for me. Um. Although how much of that is nostalgia for the, the first couple games from when Fallout, Fallout 2 came out, I don't know. Well, I didn't play Fallout Fallout 2, and I was totally hooked on Fallout 3. Okay. That was the first Fallout game. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, so what's that, Bashida, right? I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, so they also have some attention to, to story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that's the biggest downfall of Destiny. There's no effing story. Or if there is... What the hell is it? And I don't want to read collectible cards within my game to try to figure out the damn story. Tinklebot told you the whole story. Uh, well, I think I think the Destiny is trying to be too many things for too many different people. Because it's, it's the mechanics of that game are brilliant. It plays great. Oh yeah, you know, it feels good to play that as a shooter, but it's so effing boring. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine really Battlefield with those mechanics? <laughs> Oh, my God, it would be great. And Battlefield has no effing story. Well, there's a single-player campaign. I'm sure it has a story. And at least four uh, people have played it. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I played them all and <laughs> did it mainly to unlock the guns. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah. 
Call of Duty has no story, but they're brilliant set pieces. So that's kind of a living action film. But yeah, I think you're right. You get more stories in an RPG. Yeah, and I think I think as far as I'm concerned, RPGs fantasy is really where it's at. Um, I don't know, but I think it's my my background. So Final Fantasy, Might and Magic, you know these RPGs that I played when I was younger. When I think RPG, I think fantasy is the perfect fit, mm-hmm. and I think sci-fi is not quite there. Okay. Yeah, the only place where I think people <clears throat> and see, I didn't particularly enjoy them, played them, but I didn't enjoy them would be the Mass Effect games, because there were people that were really into those stories and got so upset when it didn't end right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, if it was just about playing the game and the mechanics and stuff, who cares how it ends uh, as much. But I think there were some people truly invested in, you know, their characters. And that was more like sci-fi horror, right? I never played any of those games. No, no, there's no real horror element. It was oh, okay. pretty much straight up alien invasion. It's basically the same as the, oh, people would be so pissed hearing me say this. It's the same as the Halo story. Uh, Great, this is what we generate views. Yes. <laughs> the, you know, the... <laughs> super civilization from elsewhere coming and nuking everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spoiler alert. is the only hope because we're all jingoistic, you know, buttheads that <laughs> believe you need a human being to fix things. Um, yeah. So, but I like the Halo story. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, makes takes it beyond just being a shooter. So <laughs> that and the music. So, and I prefer almost always sci-fi music. So the Lord of the Rings movie may be the only exception where I really preferred, where I really enjoyed that fantasy soundtrack. What about John Williams for Star Wars? You just classified Star Wars as fantasy. Am I, am I poking holes in you again? No, it's I'm me. in space opera. Yeah, uh, he said space opera, I said fantasy. I punted to a totally different category. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Oh God, people hate this too. I don't like most of John Williams' stuff. It's catchy and iconic, and I have a whole hell of a lot of nostalgia for it from growing up with those with John Williams scores. But those aren't my favorite. Oh, I thought of one: uh, the Conan soundtrack. I loved that soundtrack. Flash that Gordon fantasy. <laughs> it's a great soundtrack. Queen. Uh, yeah. Flash. Well, it's the same uh, reason as Highlander. I put that with the high, my Highlander soundtrack. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, Highlander was a great uh, fantasy movie. The yes. first, the first one. I, I don't acknowledge that there were any future ones. The second one was supposed to be a sci-fi movie, and that's where it all goes wrong. <laughs> I, yeah. No, actually, I think this is something worth pointing out. When you have uh, the shift from one to the other, it doesn't always work very well. It sure and, is all in there. Yeah, and you know, Highlander is a good example of that. I mean, that one's just got awful. Uh, the <laughs> second one, I mean... I, I, that was you, a bad movie. He you switches like, swords, like, randomly in the middle of fights. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? You know, all That's of a sudden... different just, angles, and it's just like, they couldn't even get yeah, sword continuity. <laughs> there are also aliens, and, and they're, you know, teleported to Earth, and they're fighting this war by prox. I just, it was bizarre. And, and oh, yeah, it, what what a way to ruin a good movie. <laughs> I, I loved the first Highlander film. I even, it was awesome. I even liked the Highlander TV show with Adrian Paul. That was pretty okay. But that second movie was awful. Because yeah. he had, uh, Adrian Paul had charisma. Yes. Well, that's what did it, right? Yeah. I mean, and uh, Christopher Lambert was in the first episode. Yeah, blind as a bat. Yeah. You know, waving around his sword with an edge on it. <laughs> it's like, I can't see past the hinge of my nose. Give me a sword. <laughs> okay, because he's blind as a bat and won't wear contacts. So. That's true. <laughs> Which reminds me, we do need to watch Blind Samurai. Yes. You can't Blind force Fury. us to watch those films. That's... Yes, you must watch Blind Fury. Blind Fury is in your future. You too must want the kid to die every moment of the film. 
You have never sold strange. this film as something that we'd ever want to watch. There's your problem. <laughs> you should watch like ten minutes of it. I've like, watched you, the intro you'll with you. Agree with me that the child must die. <laughs> the one that he's supposed to be protecting the whole film, and the entire time I'm thinking, just accidentally cut his head off. Please, just accidentally <laughs> cut it. Off. I mean, there's clearly a brand of uh, you know YouTube series that should be coming out in the future, which is the movies that are done correctly edited. And it's just, you know, you have these film, you show up, God, that kid's annoying, kill him, and that's the movie. The end, <laughs> credits roll. Uh, it's like there's that YouTube series that analyzes what would actually happen to the hero if they went through things. Mm. Like, Die Hard, 43 deaths. You know, uh, they go through all the times that would, his actions would have killed him. Uh, some of those are great. Yeah. My other favorite one would be Honest Movie Trailers. Mm. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> What's the one for The Matrix? So, I don't know, they add all kinds of subtext to that film. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we've clearly gone over an hour. So, Chris? You're up, man. Well, then remember, boys and girls, whatever you do, just keep it awesome. <laughs>